I will. Right. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to get the Facebook stream started. Cool, cool. And as always, if you want to let us know in the chat where you're watching from, give a shout out to your place. We'd love to learn where you are. Yeah. Puerto Rico. This is exciting. Yeah, we've had great turnout from all over the place this year. Awesome. Good evening, Puerto Rico. Good morning in Pakistan. I know I really admire everybody who tunes in like really early in the morning or the middle of the night. Y'all are devoted. Aloha e haoli. Yeah, definitely devoted. devoted. UK and Egypt, oh my gosh, it must be the middle of the night there. Indonesia. Aloha e kaimi. Oh, keolani, aloha keolani. Chloe, how cool. This is fun. Good morning to Georgia. I assume the Georgia on the other side of the ocean, not uh, in the US. Likely. Likely. All right, we'll give it just one more minute for folks to trickle in and uh, then we'll dive in to one of the most exciting webinar topics. <laughs> well, hey there from Washington. Greetings also from the Pacific Northwest. I'm in Portland. All right on. Aloha, Bradley, Lauren, so many of my students. Aloha. Oh, nice. Gosh, what time is it in Ethiopia? I'm going to guess maybe what, three in the morning, four in the morning? Something rugged like that. Rugged. <laughs> <laughs> Last, uh, New Westminster, Mexico. Cool. All right. Well, hi to everybody, wherever you are in the world. 4 a.m. Wow, you guys are champs. All right. Well, without further ado, we are three minutes past whatever hour it is where you are. And uh, I am delighted to hand it over to Ha'a Solomon for tonight's session. Take it away. Mahalo Anna, aloha kako, aloha wayanuhea, kako apau. Uh, greetings everyone from all over the world. This is really exciting. Aloha Alyssa, keep seeing my haumana popping up in the chat. I'm really happy you folks are all here. Um, I have some slides prepared. Two things before we start. If my audio glitches out, feel free to put in the chat. Can you repeat what you just said? Rewind 10 seconds. Um, it shouldn't be a problem, but if it is, just uh, don't have, don't be embarrassed to ask me to repeat myself. And then the other thing I want to say is we can keep this very um, discussion based. I know we're not in the same, uh, this is being live streamed. So, but I can see what you folks put in the chat. Um, some of them, some of the, insights or questions you, for, you folks put in the chat might be um, um, reserved for the end, but uh, we'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. We can go off script for a little bit and then come back. I'm totally cool with that. Um, otherwise, let's get started. So it, this is our language documentation training webinar, week five of all the great sessions happening on behalf of Anna Baloo, the Endangered Languages Project and the Language Documentation Training Center. So I want to say mahalo. Nu'anu'a kamahalo means plenty, big, big thank you, big gratitude, lots of gratitude to, to these folks here on the screen for having me again. I'm really happy to be here. Let me rewind real quick. My name is Noah Ha'alidio Solomon. I usually go by Ha'a. Today's date in a Hawaiian universe, in a Hawaiian worldview, is Pukahi. Uh, Pukahi is the name of tonight's moon cycle. And the month is Velehu. Pukahi Velehu in a Roman calendar corresponds to the, the 28th of October. 
And this I wanted to throw out as an example, um, one of our first examples that answers the question, when we're documenting language, what's, what cultural knowledge is indexed by that language that's important for us to pay attention to? It's not just the language we are uh, interested in documenting, it should also, uh, there's a culture indexed by that, there's a culture behind, there's a culture closely connected to that language. And this is a good example of, instead of um, a Roman calendar, we have a traditional Hawaiian, Polynesian, Austronesian even, um, way of ordering days and months and seasons. So this is our first example that we'll keep in our pockets. <clears throat> Real quickly, Ovayao, who am I? Why am I here? Um, I'm a Olelo Hawaii professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in a department called the Halau Olelo Hawaii or Kawaii Huelani. The Kawaii Huelani twisting my words, Kawai Huilani Center for Hawaiian Language. Uh, it's at, in Honolulu, in a place called Manoa. And on that same campus, just about two buildings down, in another building, I'm doing a PhD in the Department of Linguistics, where I also finished my MA. And this has led me to have various, lots and lots of interests um, about language in general. But if I were to narrow it down specifically, it would probably be language revitalization language shift, language attitudes, and TEK. And this is an acronym that we're gonna to get to know very well today. TEK usually stands for traditional ecological knowledge. There's sort of other terms that are similar. Um, on the slide before it was traditional knowledge. Other people have called it um, local knowledge, cultural knowledge, biocultural knowledge. They were kind of um, using this, these terms loosely and sort of synonymously as well. So that's who I am. I wanna start off with this quote about the really close, intimate connection that uh, ties together language and culture. I'm sorry for the background noise if folks can hear that, but uh, the interconnectedness between a language and a culture cannot be overstated. Usually a certain language or at least a language variety identifies a specific group of people. So we want to keep this in mind because engaging with other languages means engaging with the culture's type. Oh, I, there's a typo, sorry. Engaging with another language or culture it means engaging with the language or culture tied to it. You cannot understand a culture without understanding its language and vice versa. We want to keep that in mind as we go forward um, because for a while, um, certain pursuits of knowledge in a certain paradigm was kind of uh, one dimensional focus. And we want to broaden that uh, focus to include language and culture. The understanding of how connected they are. So for LDNC, which stands for Language Documentation and Conservation, it's important for us to understand the interconnectedness of language and culture. We also want to recognize the importance of culture and tradition, culture and cultural and traditional knowledge. Uh, another goal is to recognize the biodiversity that exists among, across, and between cultures. And of course, we're striving to document and conserve cultural, traditional, and ecological knowledge systems in our pursuit, in our general pursuit of linguistic knowledge as well. Um, so it's sort of um, these pursuits running parallel, yeah, with each other. Um, I love this quote, and I use this quote to remind us that the field of linguistics has a kuleama to empower communities such that they can determine their own linguistic destiny. Um, this was spoken to me verbatim by a dear professor in the, the linguistics department, Andrea Burrett Coker in personal communication. But this really sums up really nicely um, the current literature of, about best practices and goals of um, ling language work. And I wanna quickly draw our attention to kuleana. Um, this is an Olelo Hawaii, Hawaiian language word, a very important term and concept, cultural concept. But here's another example of um, cultural knowledge 
that's important during language work. Uh, kuleana is sort of a marriage of the term responsibility and privilege. So under this term, there's responsibility, privilege, obligation, interest, um, stakes, S-T-A-K-E, -E, that kind of stake. Uh, it's a very important term because of it is a framework for that builds out a the reciprocal nature of um, of sharing knowledge with one another, the reciprocal nature of uh, community, and so we'll revisit this concept towards the end of our talk today. But I wanted to introduce it now. And part of this empowerment of communities by language that should be done by language work that allows them to determine their own linguist linguistic destiny is that um, part of this empowerment is thorough documentation informed by paying attention to what matters to community, what matter, what's important to them, what's worthy of knowing and also transmitting. And we'll get into three examples after we um, ask these sort of framing questions. So we're talking about cultural knowledge, traditional knowledge, biocultural knowledge, biodiversity. Um, to answer these questions, I wanna show three examples for our uh, audience today. Let me just check the chat real quick. Mahalo Anna. Um, so when we're talking about traditional knowledge, what do we mean by that? Uh, it seems sort of obvious and maybe obscure at the same time. I want us to watch this short video that a friend of mine and I did. His friend and colleague of mine is uh, Danny Yarbrough. She was the artist. She's also a linguist with us at UH in finishing her PhD. And she, Danny and I created this uh, teaching tool, really. It's an animated mo'olelo o'wivi, a traditional story that we animated in uh, an animation video format with audio and all that. And it's called Heeme Iole. And before we even start talking about um, what traditional cultural knowledge is, we should think, first start thinking about it as anything included in this traditional story that was written in time immemorial, that was probably adapted very locally and sort of tailored to fit local ecosystems, even in, in Hawaii. Uh, that includes really, what I think this uh, video shows as most important is when you're, it's sort of stripped down of, um, it's stripped down to really the most important uh, when it comes down to uh, survival and securing your future for your, securing the, the future and fate of your, of your society, of your people, of your family, then really what's passed, what's gonna be passed down, whether it's through um, stories or song or music or dance, whatever is passed down is really, really important for the continuation of a certain group. So I want us to watch this, it's about less than three minutes uh, with that in mind everything we see, it might seem, uh, this is sort of a, ch a children's story, I guess, um, but what's important is really what's include, everything in included in this animation. So let me, before I'm going to also share my audio, share sound and share this video while I mute myself. A ole ho pa apono ia kavaa. No laila, i kona hiki ana mai, mai kane o he mai. Walilo kavaa ike kai. 
Huu ka pilikia nui. Ua noho i hola ka iole a ue me ka leo nui loa. Ua lohe ia kona ue ana e ke kahi hee loko mai kai. Ni nao kula ka hee iaia. E nii, he hako u pilikia? A pane mai la ka iole. Ua nalo vale ko uwaa. Ua lilo paha i ke kai. No ka mea, a ole paha mai kai ko uho o paa ana. A ole hiki ia uke hoi aku i moko lii. No ka mea, a ole hiki ia uke au au. Pane mai la ka hee na au palu palu. A ole pilikia, hiki paha ia uke ko kua aku ia oe. E pii ae oe i luna o ko upo o. A e hoi hoi a ku au ia oe i ko hone. I ke kau ano ka i ole ma luna kona po o. O ho o maka ka hee e hoi aku i moko lii. U ka nui o ko ka i ole makau. A ka, ka hea kula ka hee. E noho ma li e oe, mai makau. Ka ma aina loa au i ke i a kai. Ma hope iho, wa hiki a kula lao i moko lii. Ua iho i hola ka iole, mai luna iho ko ka he e fo'o. Aha ia kula o ia iaia. Ke mahalo nui aku nei au ia oe no kou lawe ana mai iau. A i ke kahi makana nao, mai luna o kou po'o. A holo a vivi a kula ka iole i uka. Ua haha e la ka he e mai luna o kona po'o. A loa a ke ku kai. Ua ki o ka iole mai luna ke po'o no ka mea maka u loa o ia. Hu ka huhu nui o ka he e. Mai ke la manawa mai, i nga ike ia ka leho e ka hee, ua lalau o ia iaia, no ka mea, mana o oia, o ka iole no ia. Hana ka poa e paki tika, i ke kahi mea i kapa ia he lu hee, me ka poa haku, a me ka leho, a loa a ka hee ia lako, me ke ia mea. Pipi holo ka ao! Uh, oh yeah, <clears throat> mahalo. So that was entirely in Olelo, Hawaii, but I want to draw our attention to some of the things we saw, even if we don't understand the language. And what some of the things we saw in the animation are land and ocean, which is starting to build an ecology into the, into the Mo'olelo, the story itself. There's a he'e, he'e is the word for squid, which we saw, or an octopus. It's the same word in Olelo, Hawaii and also iole, which is the word for rat. So there's biological information in this. There's a va'a, which is a canoe that upon which iole uh, sails to the main island. And there's also a luhe'e at the end, we saw an octopus lure, a picture of a luhe'e. So there's technology, uh, indigenous innovation and technology. Place names, we heard kualoa, kaneohe, a few place names that are starting to index geography, spatial literacy, space making. Also, this gives us, towards the end, it gives us a reason why, or in other words, the origin of the Luhe. So there's an origin and creation story of um, the Luhe. So it's ontological, cosmogonic information. And we see these relationships or sociological information and values. Um, what is uh, what are the value systems in this particular culture that we got this story? Um, those are all important things we want to pay attention to. And you kind of get all of this great cultural knowledge through one story. So um, we'll talk about how language documentation can focus on these types of stories is a very important and a very effective uh, method. That's what we're sort of uh, going into thinking about how we're thinking about uh, traditional knowledge. And these traditional stories are great emblematic examples of what we're talking about, what we mean when we say traditional knowledge. Yeah. Let's chat real quick. <clears throat> Yes, um, there's a question about the traditional story. Do you mean stories that are transmitted from generation to generation orally, whose writer is uh, not known? Um, this is a great question that I'll answer right now. It's, it's very relevant right now since we just saw this. Uh, let's see. This would be a story that you probably cannot tie to a certain writer or, or author. Um, I mentioned earlier that this type of story can be 
it can be and probably was and, and probably still is today adapted to a certain island or a certain region of an island even, to fit the uh, ecosystem of that, which is to fit the uh, really the needs of that place. It's if you distill it down, it has some universal values. So when I say traditional story, it's um, by this, I mean very, very old, passed down orally to the next generation. And they were uh, written down, this was, I believe, written down in probably the 1950s or 1960s. So we have a written record of it now, but um, for most of its life, this particular story and many, many, many like it were transmitted orally as an oral tradition. So what we saw, including everything in the Mo'olelo that we, uh, we just watched, together all of these knowledge systems constitute a language's worldview. And that's really the richness of, um, any, of this, any of these pursuits, language documentation, other language work, really the, rich, the richest parts of um, this research are when we can start to uh, understand a language as it's indexing a worldview because all worldviews are unique. So tied to linguistic diversity or cultural diversity is this diversity of worldview. And we're not gonna to talk too much about worldview. We can after if we have time, but it's really how a, maybe a, a culture's shaping an in, in individual of that culture, how it shapes their worldview, how they perceive the world, how they view the world, how they value the world or the reality of it. Um, so it's a very important concept um, that we want to pay attention to. A language's worldview is at the core of language documentation and conservation. I'll say that much um, because it's so important. Let me pull my laser. Time. Okay. So what I also want to think about before we go into these exam more examples, um, what about what in your language maybe has a precise term and in another language, it takes more words to explain. What, what examples can you think of in your language or a language you're working with or a language you've learned before is very highly developed that such that it's maybe one word in that language and it, it gets um, maybe a whole paragraph to translate it into another language. Those are really interesting very rich examples. Um, and they usually come from terminology for kinship or family relationships, taxonomies or indexical knowledge, uh, knowledge about native and or endemic flora and fauna or ethnobotanical knowledge, uh, knowledge about technology, uh, knowledge about culture, traditions and ecology. All of these sort of point to differences in ways of knowing different ways of knowing, alternative literacies, or the big buzzword for this is what's important to a culture such that they know it and they have terms for it and they have language to talk about it and they have language to transmit it to the next generation. What's important that the next generation knows? And these, we can, of, of course, we cannot expect epistemologies to be um, the same across cross-culturally or cross-linguistically. So again, when we talk about language documentation, then finding out what's important to know, what's important to transmit is uh, a very worthy, worthwhile, and a very effective uh, model for language documentation. The three examples we're gonna look at today, um, you folks might recognize it. These, if, especially if you are in Hawaii or have ever been to Hawaii, the kukui nut, the ohi alehua, and an eva bird, a shore bird. So two examples of flora and one example of fauna. And we're gonna talk about these three examples and their values in sort of four different ways. Their ecological value, their value in material culture, their folkloric value, and their linguistic value. Let's start with the ohi alehua. Uh, the ohi alehua is a, an iconic, um, tree and blossom uh, for Hawaii. It's symbolic for Hawaii because of how important this has been um, since pre-contact times, since time immemorial. Um, the 
ecological value of the Ohi Alehua. In Latin terms, it's the Metro Sideris. Uh, this is one variety. Macropus. Also, I've seen uh, they're called Metro Sideris polyensis, I believe. Anyway, the Hawaiian word, the Hawaiian name, the Hawaiian label is Ohi Alehua. And I've heard it said that, uh, that if you break down the word Ohia, you find the word Ohi, which means to gather. And the idea behind that gather is that it's gathering water. So the very name suggests it's an ecological value. And in a written, uh, in an oral tradition, in an oral culture, we need these sort of uh, mnemonic devices, if you will, these sort of devices to help us uh, uh, index and remember what's, what is this, what do we call it and why. Uh, so this is gonna be an important uh, example, um, giving us a name that uh, has a, a reminder built in it. This is also ecologically speaking, the first tree to, go, to grow out of new lava flow. And if you've been to the Hawaiian islands, especially Hawaii, the big island, there are lava flows very often. And um, what I love about this example is some people interpret, some people um, hear about lava flows and they, they think of it as destruction. But on the flip side of that, it's um, in a Hawaiian world view, it was not necessarily destructive, it was more cleansing or regenerative because out of a new, a brand new lava flow come these um, ohi alehua trees. And because of how valuable and important the ohi alehua tree is, um, then a, a lava flow in, in that case is, is uh, positive, it's, uh, it's beneficial. Another thing the ohi alehua does is it the same, the word lehua corresponds to a variety of kalo or taro, um, which is a staple crop in Hawaii, as well as other many other Polynesian uh, places, uh, oceanic places. And if there's a lehua that grows as a blossom, and there's also a lehua that grows as a kalo variety, then what we're seeing is pairs of epistemology. And it's a particular and unique way that the Hawaiian universe is organized. The Hawaiian universe is indexed. The next thing I want to also talk about how, in terms of material culture, how valuable Ohi Alehua is. It's used as hardwood for building homes, hale, traditional hale. Uh, it's used to build bowl, to make uh, wooden bowls to hold food and water and other um, other things. It's used in, I've heard it used uh, because it's a very sturdy hardwood. The leaves and the blossoms are made into lei. And there's also a very significant symbolism in the practice of hula that the ohi alehua has. And I think I'll talk about it a little bit more about that. The reason is because um, folklorically, and in the mythscape of Hawaii, um, given the importance of the Ohi Alehua, it's, it also appears in dozens of Mo'olelo or stories. Um, and it, in doing so, it's also gained myriad symbolisms. So this Ohi Alehua tree is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for love, romantic love, it's a metaphor for a female in a romantic situation, a romantic relationship. And it's also uh, very euphemistic. And this, um, usually if the lehua is the female, then a bird that comes to either nest or sip from the lehua, sip the nectar, that would be the, considered the male. And we can sort of see why those are why that two, that relationship between the bird and the flower is, um, has become a very poetic and beautiful metaphor for um, stories and song. Mo'olelo and mele. 
there are also um, several meanings that this word lehua has. Yeah. Uh, lehua, one of the meanings of lehua is an expert or someone who is swift and strong, a role model in a certain field or industry. Uh, another meaning is warrior or another uh, a more specific meaning in that sense is a first warrior, the first warrior to wage battle. The first warrior to run onto the battlefield is called the lehua. Uh, it's also, one of the meanings is sweetheart, um, denoting a beloved friend or relative among other poetic references. So we see uh, polysemy, multiple meanings in the symbol word that are of course absolutely important when documenting a language. How many meanings does this word have? There's one meaning probably most common. There's probably one meaning most quickly associated with it, but what else does this word mean? So we're paying attention to uh, the multiple meanings as well. Kukui, let me, before we move on, let me just double check the chat. Oh, Anna. And I think the big buzzword you asked about when I froze was epistemology. That sound right? I believe. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. Um, epistemology meaning a, a way of knowing and what counts as knowledge. Yeah. <clears throat> important, important clarification. Mahalo, Anna. The kukui tree, also another tree very important that has lots of biocultural symbolism that we wanna make sure we're paying attention to when we're talking about language documentation. We're not just documenting the language, we want to also um, document the culture. Ecologically speaking, a kukui is um, important in, in the forest because it's very, very large and very, very strong. Uh, the, I won't try to say the, I won't try to pronounce the Latin name, but the local nickname is the candle nut tree. And we'll see why in a little bit. It's called the candle nut tree. But the Hawaiian word is kukui. The nuts look like this. After you break them open or after you might roast them, um, it, the kukui is a softwood. And softwood used for canoes, I've, um, seen that in Mo'olelo. Uh, the sap and the bark nowadays, up until today, especially in uh, hula, the practice of hula traditions, are used to dye uh, plant materials and bark cloth. The nuts are very versatile and useful. Uh, they're chewed for fishing activities and they're made into lei. Some of you folks have probably worn a kukui lei because of how common they are. And if you've ever had Hawaiian food, inamona on top, inamona is made from kukui nuts. And it's this delicious condiment. My favorite is to eat it on poke. Poke is uh, very popular right now as well. Um, folklorically, the kukui, particularly the leaf, is a kino lao or a physical manifestation of a shapeshifter that goes by the name of Kamapua'a. There are dozens of stories about this really rascal shapeshifter named Kamapua'a. Um, and the symbolism is rooted in the fact that pua'a, pigs, wild boars in Hawaii, we have wild boars here, they eat the nuts of the kukui tree. And also, if you look at this, the shape of this leaf, it sort of represents the snout and ears of a boar which might be kind of easier to see here. So if ever one day somebody's ask, asking, kukui, what is kukui? Well, that's the, that's the tree that this linguistic term kukui points to, but there's a whole lot of other culture behind that that's also important to document. Linguistically, kukui means lamp or light or torch. And therefore, figuratively, it means a leader or a guide, enlightenment or wisdom. There's also these turns of phrases that emerged in Olelo Hawaii, the Hawaiian language. For example, malu kukui, 
literally kukui shade, the shade of a kukui tree. Uh, if that's a concept applied to you, it means your genealogy is questionable, maybe not worthy of higher status. So we see uh, this tree has been built into the vernacular and um, certain um, proverbial sayings in the language. Very important. The last thing, the last example I want to talk about um, as being uh, very rich with cultural, biocultural, traditional knowledge is the Eva bird. This is a shorebird. Some of you folks might have seen this. Native to Hawaii. I've seen, um, I've also seen these birds in other parts of the Pacific. I'm not sure they're the same. Uh, exact same species, they would probably be considered the same family. But Eva here in Hawaii are large, and I've seen Eva in other parts of the Pacific, such as Tahiti, and they're smaller. Uh, the Eva is known for eating other birds' food. And I think one of my students actually just today asked about um, if the Eva is symbolic for thievery. And um, which is a possibility because it's reputation for stealing other birds' food. Uh, it forces them to disgorge their food that they've already eaten, and then it steals it. So in, in that sense, it has a negative connotation. The connotation is not a good one. It's not a, rep a good reputation to have in that sense. However, there are some positive attributes to assign to the evil bird. Um, and that comes from the fact that materially, their feathers are used as gifts. Because they fly so high, because they are sort of the untouchables of the sky, then their feathers are very prized, of course. And I've actually witnessed a gift giving uh, ceremony, a gift giving moment um, when a Hawaiian person gave a distinguished Maori language speaker and a Maori person, gifts of uh, the gift he gave was um, feather tail feathers of an eva bird. So that's still today used as um, symbolic for a very prized and rare gift. And um, like other bird feathers in Hawaiian culture, they are used in lei hulu or lays made of feather, or kahili, which is a feather standard royal insignia to, um, is, as a symbol to show that royalty is around or royalty is present. Eva are also navigational aids. If you're on a canoe in the open ocean and you spot an Eva bird, then that probably indicates land is near. Um, the sort of been interpreted as as a motif in a traditional kakao or uhi or Hawaiian tattooing, it has a nice shape to it. And again, that it has an epistemological pair because there's also a fern called Eva or Eva Eva. So another epistemological pair that Hawaiians use to order the universe. In terms of folklore uh, in Eva, here's some more positive uh, characteristics of an Eva. It's usually symbolic of an attractive person. Um, on the other, on the flip side, as we already talked about, also used to denote thievery, navigational value, and it's um, apparent. It's a apparent to the Kauai bird, which is another one. So there's a uh, familiar relationship among the these these birds. If we say ki kaha ka eva, the eva glides in the air without even flapping its wings. Kikaha is to fly without flapping wings. Kikaha kaiva is a compliment paid to an attractive person. Um, we have an, um, a near minimal pair, a word that almost sounds like eva, which is eva. Can we hear the difference between eva and eva? One has this glottal stop in the beginning and the other doesn't. Eva without the glottal stop is the word for nine the cardinal number nine. 
Um, and symbolically, the Eva is used in one of King Kamehameha's names, the most powerful king of Hawaii. One of his epithets was Kaiva Kilo Moku, the Eva bird that snares islands. You can't get much higher praise than that for a name that um, very accurately portrays Kamehameha's power. So we arrive at this question. Before I ask this question, let me check the Q&A real quick. Let's see, nothing, nothing new yet. Um, we're talking about all of this traditional knowledge and culturally unique knowledge. Basically, uh, up until now, we've been kind of, we haven't even uh, addressed the topic, a very important topic. Should all of this knowledge be documented? Because if it's documented and it gets in the wrong hands, that could be dangerous, that could be harmful, that could be problematic, that could be traumatic. So I need to acknowledge the fact that some forms of knowledge are sacred and they're not meant to be shared publicly and that's completely okay. Then we get to this question, okay, if that's the case, if some knowledge is sacred and should only be accessible to a certain group, then what are some solutions to make sure that knowledge is passed on appropriately? I'll ask that again. What are some solutions to make sure that knowledge is passed on in appropriate ways? And this is where audience participation is absolutely encouraged. I would love to hear your thoughts. Another way we might put it is to revisit this idea that I mentioned earlier, this word kuleana. This is one of those words that clearly takes a whole paragraph to describe and define. And this isn't just descriptive definition, this is also prescriptive. How do you use the word kuleana? Kuleana in a culturally appropriate way. Kulian, how do you use this word without appropriate, misappropriating it? Because we all know how much cultural appropriation, linguistic appropriation, or misappropriation happens. This is um, it, an entry from the Hawaiian Dictionary written by Mrs. Mary Kavena Pui, one of Hawaii's most illustrious and productive scholars, and her colleague Samuel Albert. And this is the most authoritative dictionary that we have today. So we can trust this description and prescription of this word kuleana, right, privilege, concern, responsibility, title, business, property, all of these words, yeah? And then several examples of how to use it. But sort of to distill it down, it's a reciprocal relationship that revolves around responsibility, the idea that the more responsible you are to someone, something, the more committed you are to that responsibility, the more privilege you'll get. But the more privilege you have with respect to that person or to that endeavor or that project or whatever it is, the more privilege you have gets you more responsibility. So it's this cyclical relationship. Juliana is a sort of a cycle. The more A you have, the more B. The more B you have, the more A. I wanna take this concept and idea, this notion of kuleana and ask everybody here um, to get sort of uh, uh, reflective and introspective. If you belong to a community or if, you're, if you consider, if you identify as a heritage language of a of a heritage language speaker, and you're trying to, uh, you're pursuing language documentation in that language, then I would like you folks to consider what your kuleana is to your language, to your culture, to your community. And also what is your kuleana to your role as a participant in whatever project it is? Is it a language documentation project? Is it a revitalization movement? Is it a research project for something else? These questions here on this slide are meant for folks who um, 
already have a language community in mind. And if you haven't yet situated yourself into a specific community or a research project, then you're thinking about one, then uh, maybe your decision can be informed by these, by the answers, by your individual answers to these questions. What is the researcher's kuleana to their own research? What is the researcher's kuleana to another's language and culture? Especially if they're an outsider to that culture, to that group. And what is the researcher's kuleana to the community of speakers? Those are sort of uh, the general question that I want us to um, think about. And with that, I kind of, let's see, let me go out of full screen. And we have, Anna, can you remind me how much, this is uh, scheduled to go until, for another- we got about 15 minutes, but if people have a lot of questions, we can stay longer. Okay, great, great. So I can see the full chat is much more easily now. Let's see, Tes Tesfaya, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Can we say documented if it has already, so we're going back to questions that were not uh, addressed yet, and then we can come back to Julian. If it's already been written or has a written document, oh, that's a great question. What is the purpose of documenting, particularly documenting this particular story? So I think, and I cannot speak for the doc, the original documenter, which was Mary Kamena Pukui, the one who uh, documented the He'e and uh, Iole story that I showed. If my best guess is because Mrs. Pukui around the 1950s realized Hawaiian language is losing speakers. Hawaiian, native Hawaiian, native speakers of Olala Hawaii are not teaching their children or their grandchildren. So there's a big risk, a calculable risk that this story in particular will not, uh, will not be transmitted to the next generation. So written documentation was the second best solution. And also written documentation allows for the oral transmission. Later on, and later on down the line, if perhaps there's a intergenerational disruption. But Anna, do you have anything to add about, can we say documented if it's already been written down or has a written document? It's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. I, I would say that if there's only a written version and people still tell it orally, it's definitely worth, if people are interested in recording a video or audio recording of the story, it's great to have that in addition to the written version, right? Because so much happens in the tone of our voice and the way we use our face and hands. And if all we have is a written document, you lose all that. So even if something's written down and you have the opportunity to get a video recording or an audio recording, there's a lot of added value there. Love that. Thank you, Anna. I love that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Anna sort of uh, worded the question differently. Um, Chloe, I'm not sure if your, your question was, I might uh, ask you to retype your question, but in the meantime, Anna said, and what to do, what do we do if the holders of that knowledge don't want to pass it on? That happens sometimes, yeah. We can be, we can have, we as researchers, or someone interested in the future, someone interested in making sure that this language gets taught and spoken into the future, even if that's our intention. What happens when uh, sometimes people don't want that? And those people come from the communities themselves. That's very, that's real. Yeah. Oof. Very good questions. And I might ask you if, uh, to expound on that a little bit, but if you have time. Sure, yeah, no, I'm, I'm just thinking of, 
So in my own work, I work with the Yasa language community in Cameroon, and there is a lot of sacred knowledge that probably wouldn't be appropriate for me to document, but even the handful of elders who have that knowledge don't really want to teach it to young people in their own communities. And there's a lot of complicated reasons for that having to do with sort of the danger of that knowledge and the power of that knowledge, but they just want it to go away when they pass away. And uh, they want that knowledge to stop being passed on. And so what do people within the community do? Even if they want to learn that, you can't force elders to teach you. So there's no good answer there other than you really can't force anybody to teach you anything they don't want to teach you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I would never force that. I'm thinking of a uh, an example here in Hawaii. Um, I keep going back to Mrs. Pukui because of how important her documentation work was. She was a pro, she was a mass, she was amazing at documenting language and culture, but a lot of the cultural documentation and even linguistic documentation she got, were, um, they are now locked away. They're now uh, inaccessible because the interviewees who came and decided, I think we take for granted nowadays, the idea of recording yourself whether it's your voice or your, your, uh, yourself or both. Um, you know, 50 years ago, there were some, 50 years ago, even 30 years ago, some people in Hawaii, some of the elders especially were very, uh, it was such a new idea to them. So I, I say that just to contextualize uh, those who came and shared their knowledge with Mrs. Pukui, and she was working at the Bishop Museum here. Um, some of them said, I don't want this shared with anyone else except the names I list here. Or another example, I don't want this shared with anyone else except people who can prove that they descend from me, people who can prove that they're my family members. Um, <clears throat> so what happens when maybe those, the, the family members um, aren't around it? So what happens to that knowledge? It's a very tricky question um, if uh, access to determining protocols and access to this very sacred, important knowledge. Yeah. And I really, the 21st century makes us, at least for me, I take it for granted all the time, how knowledge can be sacred and so important. So therefore it's important to steward it correctly, important, very importantly. But yeah. Mahalo, Anna. Robert's asking, how does Kuleana work with non-native speakers who might be creating government policy? Uh, Robert, can I ask you to clarify, you mean non-native ethnic Hawaiian, uh, people who are not ethnically Hawaiian or people who are not, people whose language, native language is not Hawaiian? You mean like L2 learners or non-ethnic Hawaiian people? Because that's gonna determine how I answer. Well, I think um, really kuleana, if you're, if you're creating government policy and you, you have that kuleana, um, ah, I see non-native telescope placement. Um, I think, I will say, I, was, I guess I'll let the, the reality speak for itself in specifically in terms of the construction of a telescope, if, I, if folks might have heard about it, that, um, that generated a big re community response, a big community mobilization. And I think that mobilization is beautiful and powerful and makes me um, just, it makes me emotional and it makes me very, very proud to you know, in those instances when uh, grassroots really takes hold. The motivation, I think, for this mobilization, this community mobilization, is because the policymakers were not acting with very good kulian. They were not acting appropriately. They weren't considering their kuleana to the communities that are directly affected with, uh, affected by their, uh, their construction project. 
I have to be very careful about this topic, um, but it's uh, what I can say is I think those who oppose the construction or those who are um, raising their voice in opposition are also looking for justice and are also looking for, um, it's not just uh, making waves in vain. So, um, uh, I, I hope that answered your question, Robert. I think um, people who are creating government policies, um, especially policies that have this massive impact, they should be uh, aware of their kuleana. And sometimes people call this like positionality. They should be aware of their positionality. It's a similar sort of notion. Um, you should be operating, you should be doing your job, um, thinking about how it's going to affect you and your family and your community. And, uh, and that's really what we're talking about when we, when we say kuleana. Uh, Bradley, I would say the, these pairs, the meanings carry through across the archipelago, I would say, yeah. Oh, I see, Chloe. Mahalo for your, um, your input on how to appropriately uh, transmit knowledge. Yeah. Auli is asking, what could we do if knowledge that shouldn't have been documented was documented? Are there any actions that could be taken from what would result in a positive outcome? Um, great question. This is sort of, I think, verging on uh, legality and maybe like intellectual property and copyright and all that. Um, I would say if, as a researcher, especially if you're an outsider in a community and you've accidentally or I guess intentionally documented something that's not meant for you, that's not meant to be documented, that should not go in a uh, publication or shouldn't go in an archive, then redact it, <laughs> strike it, erase it. <laughs> Can you think of any anecdotal um, examples, Anna, of that? It's interesting. I wish I could think of examples where a researcher realized they had documented something they shouldn't and redacted it. That would be good practice. I don't think I've ever heard of that happening. There are too many cases where somebody documents something they shouldn't and they just leave it out there. Yeah. Actually, I think um, we can't think of examples of redaction because uh, the practice sort of the the response to, oh, you shouldn't do that, was just, oh, well, sorry, that, right? Um, and so lots of, yeah, I, I'm not, that's it. I wouldn't know how to quantify the, the amount of uh, documentation that exists that's inappropriate, but uh, it's probably not zero. Yeah, I always, you asked, uh, let's see, who asked this? Chastity Ray, you asked if, are there any actions that could be taken that would result in a positive outcome? Ooh, that's a really big and good question. And uh, I think really a lot of universities and archives and museums are beginning to acknowledge and recognize their responsibilities to the materials they hold. And so in, in a good world, in a good outcome, you might be able to contact an archive and say, you know, listen, <laughs> here is some very clear, explanation of why you shouldn't make this available to the public, maybe they'd work with you to find a solution. I would hope so. <laughs> a good archive would. Um, I'd say all research materials you collect from a community belongs to them. That's a great philosophy. Ronnie, mahalo Ronnie. And always just ask the aunties. <laughs> yeah. Um, it in effect becomes classified. Interesting. Yeah. The real quick to maybe end on a, an anecdote from Mrs. Pukui, the, re, the researcher we, whose name has been invoked several times today. Um, she documented something that she wasn't supposed to, and she did it uh, 
uh, entirely unintentionally. And she was um, very, very, this is a, a story that's been sort of passed down in oral history. She felt just um, guilty. She was guilt-ridden, guilt-ridden for a long time. Um, and so I think that's an important dimension to this. It's how you react to it, how you feel about um, if, if it's really an accident, and, um, then uh, an honest mistake maybe. But um, I think all too often, I, I hate to, there's a certain reputation that um, researchers might have, especially certain fields, that um, the idea is there, I guess that we can assume that there, there might be a, a lot less sensitivity about these topics, about these, about the content of the documentation. Um, there might not be, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is there hasn't been um, a best practice in place that, that really uh, keeps, that maintains the integrity and the honesty of the, and the sensitivity, so. Mahalo for this link, Judith. Are there any, uh, Anna, I think any other questions I didn't address, we didn't address? Any topics? I think, I think you've got them all. Very thorough. Great, cool. What does bio, there's an anonymous attendee who asked, what does biodiversity mean in our context? Um, um, I'm not sure what who is referred to by our, and then we answer Bradley's question as well. Hmm. What does biodiversity mean in a general sense? Yeah. What does biodiversity mean in a general sense? Uh, I can sort of. I would. I might just uh, draw on the correlation between biodiversity and linguistic diversity. There are certain hot spots where biodiversity is very, very high. And historically, hopefully still today, those hot, the same hot spots that are high in biological diversity are also where lots of different languages exist. That's because of different languages have. So there's a linguistic diversity in the same areas. Usually the tropics near the equator, but Anna, what does that mean to you, biodiversity in any context? Gosh, well, I'm not a biologist, but as a linguist, biodiversity just means a place where lots of things have managed to live and thrive for a long time. And uh, I, there's some really great work out there. If y'all are familiar with Terra Lingua, there's a magazine out there. They've also published a couple books on these relationships between really biodiverse places, including sacred sites. Um, and the relationship between biodiversity and language and medicine, and it's really all very closely related. Beautiful, yeah. Ronnie said, they say around here, um, and Ronnie, I might ask, where is, where does here refer to? Around here, approximately 20 kilometers because the land changes that much. I love that idea of uh, a language being a dialogue with the environment in which it's spoken, and therefore it's highly, highly localized. And with that logic, what is what is English doing being spoken in twenty different subcontinents? <laughs> um, yeah, Terra Lingua, great Salish. Okay, Salish territory, wonderful. Well, it was a great conversation. The hour flew by. Absolutely, especially with your incredible presentation. So let's everybody give a big old thanks to Ha'a for this excellent session. Yay! Thank you so much for being here. It's always such a pleasure to have you in this webinar. Oh, uh, my pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. And thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. It was so great to hear all of your wonderful questions and comments and thoughts. And we hope if you have any questions after this that you forgot to ask, uh -uh, are you okay with sharing your email? Absolutely, sure.
or as always, you can post them in the Facebook group. Even though we're on Zoom now, the Facebook group still exists, so feel free. Okay, great. All right. And next week, we're going to shift from this kind of big picture stuff to some more technical stuff. Speaking of archives, we're going to talk a little bit about now that you've got all these amazing recordings, what kind of metadata do they need? How do we organize these files neatly? And maybe even how do we do a little bit of annotation in Elan? So don't get intimidated. It's a little technical, but we're going to go through it gently with Anajima Psychia. So tune in next week, same time. Yeah, I'll be here. Yay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, I hope you all have a great night or day or morning or midnight. Yeah, yep. good evening slash morning to all of y'all. Good evening. Right, and thanks again, Hav. Okay, Anna, anytime. My pleasure. Mahalo kako. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.